Welcome to this ongoing series of lectures in group theory. In this lecture, we'll so we'll see another proof of Euclid's theorem, uh, just in the same line as we saw an alternate proof of alternate proof of what uh, division with remainder. Yes, so it it'll be along the same lines. Right. So let's get started. Uh, we just recall the relevant material. We proved Euclid's theorem last uh, time, and this is what it said. If we have two integers, which are not both zero, so that you can take their GCD, and if you call D their GCD, then there exist integers x and y, such that you can write D in this fashion. So you can write D as an integer linear combination of A and B. All right, so we'll reprove this today in a different manner as we proved uh, the last time, uh, compared to what we did the last time. All right. Uh, and uh, let us recall a simple fact that we showed in some couple of lectures ago is that if we have two integers and again not both zero and say that a is equal to bq plus r for some integers q and r so i'm not insisting that r is in any particular range or any such thing it's just some integer uh, satisfying this equation then gcd of a comma b is gcd of b comma r so we showed this earlier and we'll use this today. And lastly, recall this particular very simple version of well-ordering principle is that if we have a function from some set s to n, no matter what the set s is, there is some element s not in capital S such that this happens for each element in s. So there is some s not in capital S such that its image is smallest amongst all possible images. And this is nothing but well-ordering principle. All right, so let's get started. So here is the thing. So suppose you have a and b not two integers, but two natural numbers. So for, for natural numbers, we will prove that there exist x, y, which are integers such that this, this happens. You can write GCD as the corresponding integer linear combination. So if we prove this for natural numbers, it follows for uh, integers also. Because if suppose we have a negative natural, uh, sorry, a negative integer here, then we can just replace that by minus a, it becomes a natural number. And now we, if we do this, uh, taking care of the signs, you, you will have shown that for a and b also. So all I'm trying to say is that it is enough to prove Euclid's theorem for the case when a and b are natural numbers. So that is what we will do. All right, so collect all the things which do not uh, satisfy the above theorem. So let s be those pairs of natural numbers such that there does not, there do not exist integers x and y satisfying ax plus by equals gcd of a and b. So we collect all those pairs for which this theorem is false. So the goal is to show that S is empty. If we show that S is empty, we are done. So assume on the contrary that S is non-empty. Okay, and now define, since S is non-empty, we can define a function f from S to natural numbers, which takes a pair to the sum. So this is just like we did for the alternate proof of division with remainder. Basically, um, again, I'm repeating the thing. Uh, you can think of f as something that measures the size of an element of S. And now we will pick something with the smallest size. So let a naught, B naught, B an element of S, such that F of A naught, B naught is smallest possible. Right. Okay. So there are a few cases. So case one,
a naught is equal to b naught. So here what happens? We have GCD of a naught b naught is a naught because the th because the two integers are equal, and of course a naught is nothing but a naught times one plus b naught times zero. So we see that actually this pair a naught comma b naught is not lying in S, but it was a member of S which achieved the minimum size of uh, minimum you know minimum value for F. So in particular, it is a member of S, and this is a contradiction. This says that this is not a member of S, and this says that this is a member of S. So this is a contradiction, and therefore case one cannot happen. Okay, so let's go to case two. Case two is that a naught is greater than b naught. So here, then f of a naught minus b naught. So first of all, then a naught minus b naught comma b naught is actually in this set natural cross naturals, and the size of this pair is a naught minus b naught plus b naught which is equal to a naught which is strictly less than a naught plus b naught which is equal to f of a naught plus b a naught comma b naught so therefore this pair a naught minus b naught sorry a naught minus yeah a naught minus b naught comma b naught this cannot lie in S because if this were in S then it would be an element in S which achieves a smaller image under F but by choice of A0, B0 this, this was the thing which achieves the smaller image the smallest image and since this image is strictly smaller than the smallest possible this you know so, so we have this conclusion I hope you see that all right, so therefore, by definition of S, there exist integers X and Y such that GCD of A0 minus B0 comma B0 equals A0 minus B0 times X plus B0 Y. But now we use that fact that this GCD is same as, so this is a crucial step. This is same as GCD A0, B0. So I, I will say a little bit about that. So this is um, B0, Y minus X. Yeah. So why is this GCD? same as that D, that GCD it's because the reason for this equality let me draw a box so a naught equals b naught times 1 plus a naught minus B naught. So if you think of this as something is equal to something times Q plus R, then by the fact that we recalled at the beginning of this lecture, this becomes GCD or this gives GCD equals, oh sorry, GCD of A naught comma B naught equals GCD of B naught comma A naught minus B naught. So this equality is, is same as that equality. You just have to shuffle the things around and that's it. So this is the reason. All right, but now if you look at look at this equation, this says that GCD of A0, B0 can indeed be written as integer linear combination of A0 and B0. But this contradicts the fact that, basically this implies that A0, B0 is actually in, not in S, 
which contradicts the fact that a not comma b not is in s. So this is a contradiction. Again, and case three is the only remaining case, which is that a not is less than b not, and this is exactly similar to above, similar to case two, and this also leads to a contradiction. So basically in all three cases we have a contradiction and uh, therefore uh, our assumption that S is not empty must be false. Therefore S is empty and we are done. So exactly parallel to the alternate proof of the division with the remainder. And again, I find this uh, somewhat more natural to me. Maybe you find the previous proof more natural. That's completely okay. Anyway, I wanted to share this. So as usual, like, comment, share, subscribe. I also have Patreon. The link is in the description below. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.